Well, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Greetings and salutations. Thanks for joining us today. We're glad to have you here. And we're especially glad to have our first annual Robert Rifkin Visiting Professorship and our guest speaker today. So I'll say a few things about that. But first, to our speaker, uh, Dr. San Demmeets. We're delighted to have him from Johns Hopkins. And we've had a chance to interact over the last couple of years as he's been doing a lot of clinical work building on his preclinical work uh, in terms of high-dose testosterone in prostate cancer. Some really exciting things. So there's a large site uh, a trial called Transformer, of which we were one of the sites, and a chance to interact in that way. And so we're delighted to have him here. Uh, Dr. Denmate is a professor of medicine at Johns Hopkins University. He leads the prostate cancer program there and does a, a variety of good work, really a long history of doing preclinical work in this field and in uh, prostate cancer. So as I mentioned, uh, this talk will be our first annual, and, and frankly, I think we've got next year's speaker already sort of worked out, and we're really excited about that and the tradition we're starting here, uh, who will serve in the, in the capacity of the Robert Rifkin Visiting Professorship. So we've got Debbie Cleveland here representing the Rifkin family. We're delighted to have her here. We also have Dr. Michael Glodet my friend and mentor, who I don't get to see enough these days. And I'd like to invite Mike to come up and just talk about the chair and the history. Mike was the, the founding hold of that chair, and then we'll turn things over to Sam. So, Mike. Even Dr. Braun is the only person who remembers me. Um, well, so one of the great things that happens when you're a clinician is that somebody eventually walks into your uh, life and your office, and uh, Bobby Rifkin was one of the most colorful people ever to walk in, and Debbie will attest to that, having been uh, his wife. Uh, so Bobby walked into the office with advanced prostate cancer, and I took care of him for maybe four or five years uh, before he departed, but early on in our relationship, he wanted to do something for the university, and we suggested that an endowed chair would be really nice, <clears throat> and he raised money in a very unique way having uh, dinners and uh, uh, sponsorship at, his, at one of his 50 restaurants in town, which was the Diamond Cabaret uh, downtown, a gentleman's club. And uh, so some of us, uh, Dave Rabin and a few others, got to go to the Diamond Cabaret. We got permission from our wives. <clears throat> and uh, the money that was raised in those dinners uh, ended up funding this chair. The other story about Bobby that I uh, love to tell is that um, he was a, a scientist. He was a, um, an engineer. He did all of his uh, training in New York City and then went to Martin Marietta eventually and was uh, stationed in the early 60s um, in Denver and was drinking at a bar uh, in East, on East Colfax. And <clears throat> uh, it turned out that some airmen, uh, he was working for the Air Force on the Minuteman Missile Project, <clears throat> and there's a site out by the out on the eastern plains here of uh, one of these uh, Minuteman sites, and they were just completing construction of that. And Bobby was one of the people in charge of that. And some airmen walked into the bar, grabbed him, and took him out, and said, "Where are we going?" And, he, and they said, "Don't ask any questions. Go out." And it turned out to be the Cuban Missile Crisis. And uh, <clears throat> they had opened the blast doors. They had they had fueled up these rockets with uh, kerosene and oxygen, and uh, everything was ready to go. They were air, they had not. Uh, formally put the site uh, in, in use yet, and uh, these airmen walking around with manuals looking at which buttons to push and stuff, and I asked Bobby, what do you think would have happened if you'd have launched? He said, I figured Salt Lake City didn't have a chance. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, with that story uh, and good memory of Bobby Rifkin, we, we thank uh, Debbie and the family for the support, and it's really nice to have Dr. Denmead here. Thank you. Well, I'm incredibly honored to be here and uh, to be the recipient of this first uh, physics professorship. I hope it's a wonderful series that you have through the years, and uh, I hope I can at least set the bar at least somewhere. I realized I didn't really figure out how to move the slides forward with all this. Yeah. So I'm coming from Johns Hopkins today. This is a picture of Baltimore on a nice day. Uh, if you ever get a chance to visit, this is the Inner Harbor. Um, it's a lovely spot. So quickly, I'm just going to talk today about testosterone, and so I'm required to disclose that. And I'm a consultant for a company that has absolutely nothing to do with this talk, but I'm, I, I work with them a little bit. So I know many of you in the audience may not be prostophiles like uh, I am. 
So I thought I'd give you a little bit of background about the disease and um, sort of a lead into the story I want to tell you about testosterone. So prostate cancer is a big problem in the United States, but it's also a big problem around the world. Uh, over a million new cases a year. It's 15% of all cancers. About 300,000 men die each year around the world and 25,000 in America. A big variation in the incidence between uh, developed and non-developed countries that it's totally not completely clear why that is, maybe a diet uh, story. And metastatic prostate cancer, which is the thing I work on, is really, uh, it remains, even though we have a lot of new treatments emerging, still an incurable disease, uh, despite a lot of different uh, uh, ways to attack it. Um, and it's a disease that can, a man can suffer with for a pretty long time. So it, it's, it's uh, probably the slowest growing of the solid cancers that we deal with. So there's a lot of opportunity for treatments, but there's a lot of opportunity also for men to, to deal with problems for a long time. And these are some of the treatments I'll mention briefly. So most men get androgen therapy as their first treatment uh, uh, based on the disease burden, their PSA level. Uh, most men um, respond very well to that therapy initially and then develop a resistant state. And then there's a host of treatments that we can administer. But most men end up looking like this. Prostate cancer almost universally goes to the bone and uh, uh, at that point becomes a, a fatal disease. So when I started as a fellow at Johns Hopkins in 1993, this was pretty much the treatment paradigm for prostate cancer. So you had primary treatment, you uh, had a recurrence, um, you got surgical castration or uh, uh, drugs like LHRH agonists to suppress testosterone. Uh, those drugs work for a while, and then everybody becomes resistant, and eventually we came around to this term, castration-resistant prostate cancer, which in my slides will be popped up as CRPC a lot. Uh, we had some additional hormone therapies that kind of were effective, um, and that was pretty much it, and then you sort of went to hospice at that point. But eventually we proved that you can use docetaxel chemotherapy um, to improve survival, and that became part of the treatment. And now here we are in 2018, and the treatment paradigm it looks sort of like this, um, with a lot of new things in the pike. So this is fabulous for us because we have so many different options to offer the patients. It makes the discussions with the patients a little more complicated because we have a lot more to talk about. And today I'm really going to focus on the hormone part of this, even though there are uh, non-hormonal treatments that are approved and uh, some very cool things that are coming along, I think, um, in, in the clinical trial space. So hormone therapy for prostate cancer is an extremely old story. Um, and even though it's the gold standard for us, it has been the gold standard since the 1940s. And this paper appeared in a new journal in the 1940s called Cancer Research, uh, the first um, volume. Uh, describing uh, the effects of castration um, and estrogen and androgen. And in this first paper, to me, quite fascinating, it anticipated everything we do for the next 70 years. They based it on an animal model, the dog. They described the use of a new biomarker, uh, in this case, acid phosphatase. They described the first drug for cancer, which was estrogen. Um, and so the first paper was really on how that therapy affected the biomarker. And then a subsequent paper in the Archives of Surgery explained how it worked uh, to um, um, treat the disease. So Dr. Huggins uh, is kind of the grandfather, I think, of everything prostate cancer. Um, and we're still sort of exploring things he, he described 70 years, 80 years ago now. Um, We've been extremely active pharmaceutically in this area, so this is a pathway that goes from the brain to the testicle, and the brain, many of you know this already, but the brain and the testicle are talking to each other all day long in the man, sometimes not to good effect, but um, they certainly are having a conversation. And as the testosterone level in the blood drops, the level of uh, um, agonist from the brain increases in a, in a pulsatile fashion, and we've learned all kinds of ways to block that communication at the level of the hypothalamus and the pituitary, at the level of the testicle, and at the level of the peripheral um, 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 tissues. So we have a whole host of different treatments. We've pretty much saturation bombed, I think, this whole axis uh, with drugs. 
So if you look at what we have in the 40s through the 60s, we didn't really have a lot of drugs. So we had surgeons who had some scalpels that we started with taking off the testicle and then the adrenal gland and eventually even the, the pituitary gland uh, were removed as a way to disrupt the hormone axis. And then in the, in the 70s through the 90s, a whole bunch of different drugs were developed targeting this axis blocking um, either testosterone production or competing with testosterone, poisoning the adrenal gland, which is another way that testosterone gets made. And now in the 21st century, we have um, a couple of new drugs that have been approved that are probably more potent at hitting this target. Abiraterone is a drug that blocks testosterone synthesis. And enzalutamide and apalutamide uh, are drugs that are antiandrogens that are, are relatively more potent than the older drugs. ODM-201 is now called darolutamide, and it's, it's going to move up the list here because it has a name. Um, and we're also looking at ways to combine these hormones. But with all that in mind, one of the big questions we deal with is um, it is a slow-growing disease, and I'll explain to you some reasons why this is a hard question, is really should we even treat the men um, early on with prostate cancer? So there's really never been a randomized trial showing that you can improve survival with androgen deprivation. There's no good data to support using it early in the disease, late in the disease. So we, this is probably 80% of my clinic, which is talking to men who have non-metastatic disease about whether they should even get hormone therapy. And the reason we even have this conversation, hormone therapy works incredibly well. It's probably the best single drug based on response rate we have for any disease. Um, but the problems we face are, one, it has a lot of side effects. And this is a treatment that once we start it, it's forever. And the big ones are sexual side effects. So men become impotent. They lose libido. They grow breasts. They get really tired. They have mental issues. They, get, they lose memory, focus. They have pretty significant changes in their body, morphometry. They lose muscle. They gain fat, and they lose bone. So not really a benign treatment, um, particularly if you're going to give it over a decade um, to affect the man. We also know from the very earliest days, so again, this is a, a paper, the same paper from 1941, where even then, at the very beginning, they recognized that this is not a curative treatment, uh, that most of the time, that, or now we know all the time, it comes back with hormone therapy. So this is a quote from Benjamin Franklin's oncologist that no one knows about, which nothing is certain except death taxes and hormonal resistance um, in prostate cancer. So, so it, 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 for those reasons, it's a treatment that we often will discuss with patients because um, there's a downside, and it's often unclear what the upside is. That being said, when patients become resistant to hormone therapy, we now have a lot of second-line therapies. And these therapies, particularly, these are some studies summarized here uh, looking at these two new drugs, abiraterone and zalutamide. And you can see there, although these bars are pretty close, this is the control group, there is a difference and there is a survival advantage that, uh, based on months, is only a few months, based on hazard ratio, uh, is, is significant enough that these drugs can be useful in, in some men. And that advantage is less as men have more advanced disease. So you can see the numbers are lower in the patients who've already had chemotherapy. But we see also that this resistance carries over. And so here we're looking at some small studies that looked at after you get what would be the second line therapy, let's say abiraterone, when you get the third line hormone therapy, now the response drops from, this is for when it's used first. When you use it after another drug, you can see the PSA response rate, the objective response rate, how do those tumors shrink? Those numbers go way down. So it looks like resistance builds and gets carried over. The third problem we deal with that's emerging now is as we use these more potent drugs to block the androgen axis, we seem to be creating a new type of disease, which is much more neuroendocrine, more aggressive looking, and harder to treat and associated with a shorter survival. So for all these reasons, the choice of androgen deprivation is complicated of, of whether we should use it and how we should use it. So that, that sort of is a way of background of where we are sort of in prostate cancer hormonal treatment. 
And our group and many of you here have been thinking about this for a long time. What, what is this resistance and what can we do about it? Can we change this? So if you, if you look at hormone therapy from the beginning, in some ways it's a form of shock therapy. So the, the prostate cancer really, really needs the androgen receptor to function. So when you take away androgen, the major growth factor, it's a bad thing for the cell. We, what we see is very rapidly a decline in the serum testosterone level. Patients have a very rapid response in terms of pain getting better. We see the tumor have a lot of cells die off. PSA drops. People feel better in the terms of things like pain control. And that all happens within a very short time. So most of the effect we see is within the first three months of treatment. So I'm, I've sort of called that the shock phase when they first see this treatment. But then the cells kind of go into a phase that's a dormant phase where we don't really know what's happening. We know that we haven't cured the disease. Often we can't see the disease. And we think these cells are sort of learning to live in this new environment we've placed them in, this low testosterone environment. So they're adapting to this new condition in an adaptation phase. And then they start to grow back out and are resistant. Um, and that's kind of when we start seeing the patient in the clinic when there's in this resistant phase. The, one of the major things that drives this resistance is the androceptor itself. So it looks like prostate cancer is sort of addicted to the androceptor through its life. And so what we see is as we go through these phases, it starts titrating the androgen receptor level to what, I, what I've called the sweet spot. It tries to find the right level so they can grow again. It overexpresses the protein. It amplifies the gene 50 to 100-fold. Um, it starts to make variants of the androceptor that don't require the ligand. It can mutate the androceptor. It even can, the cancer can even start making its own androgen, we think. So this pathway is still critically important despite the way we've blocked it. So if you look at cell line models, this is a bunch of cell lines that we grow in, in, in uh, tissue culture compared to levels of the androgen receptor in normal or localized prostate cancer, you can see there's a marked increase, 30 to 90 fold increase in protein expression. The same is true in the patients. And so this is a study looking at AR uh, message in normal and early stage cancer versus metastases. And you can see this big increase in the level of expression in these cells. We also know experimentally, uh, if you take cells, these are wild type cells that are prostate cancer cells growing in mice with their testicles. They grow very nicely. If you take those cells and put them in a mouse that's castrated, they don't grow at all. But if you force overexpression of the androgen receptor, they grow very happily in the castrated mice. And so clearly the level of this receptor seems to be important. The other thing we see, this is a little bit complicated to walk through, but this was an experiment done by Dr. Isaacs, my colleague at Johns Hopkins. And he took a mouse, one of the tumor lines, and let it grow in a castrated mouse for a very long time. And he got a few tumors grow out after, you know, maybe a 200-day period. When you take those tumors and now you put them into mice that have their testicles or have been castrated, they actually grow equally well. Um, but if you passage them several times in an intact mouse and then go back and put them in a castrate mouse, they don't grow again. So they've been readapted and resensitized. And if you look at the androgen receptor level, it corresponds. So this is when we started in the mouse with a low level of AR. After growing in the castrate, they increase expression of the AR. And then after passaging them intact, they've down-regulated. So they have the ability to adapt to where they are in, 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 their, in their environment. So I have this model in my mind of the sweet spot. So there's a certain AR tolerance that these cells have. So if you block, whoops, wrong way. If you block them with some kind of an antiandrogen that you shock them, they stop growing. But the model suggests if you went the other way and you gave them too much androgen, they might also be shocked. And experimentally, if you look at cells, some of the cells we have from prostate cancer in tissue culture, these are cells that are exposed to either R1881, which is an androgen, or Casidex, which is an antiandrogen. And both treatments, even though they're exactly opposite of each other, both treatments inhibit the growth of the cells. 
which has always been intriguing to us, what the heck is going on there. This is also observed in animals, and so this, this is a protege of Dr. Uh, Huggins, who is Dr. Liao, who showed that you can take cells and adapt them to growing in very low testosterone. And when you put them in a mouse and give the mouse testosterone, paradoxically, you get this profound growth inhibition for a time, and then the cells start to grow again. And once again, in this experiment, you see the unadapted cells have low AR, the adapted cells here have high AR, and then when they become resistant to testosterone, they've readapted. There also is some sense here that pharmacology matters, and so there's a dose response to this androgen, so low dose seems to slightly stimulate growth, and high dose seems to inhibit uh, these cell lines. And so it's more than just giving back testosterone. It's sort of a pharmacologic dose of testosterone. And if you look at the cells growing in tissue culture, you can see when you get to the high-level androgen, you get all kinds of apoptotic figures, and cells are rounded up whereas at physiologic levels, they look very happy. The same is true of gene expression. This is just looking at CMYK. Uh, so at normal levels, the CMYK isn't really perturbed very much, but at the high levels, you get a profound inhibition of, of CMYK uh, expression. So mechanistically, we've, when I give this talk, everybody asks me, why, the, why does this work? Like, why, was, why is testosterone inhibiting the growth? And I wish I could give you the clear answer, but I'm going to give you some answers. So, or maybe some possibilities. So one thing that started us on this path was a, a group that we collaborated with at Hopkins showed if you starve cells of androgen and then give back androgen, the cells induce double-strand breaks in, the, in their DNA. And that's manifested here by these gamma H2AX foci, these pink dots. So you see an increase in the pink dots. And those pink dots come up with pretty quickly, 6, 12 hours, and then they get repaired. So is this a mechanism uh, of just normal physiology, or is this abnormal? Um, I'm going to tell you a story a little bit later about how people that respond to this seem to have DNA repair defects. So this may tie in uh, into that story. We're not totally sure. The other thing we've seen is, this is a slide I made last night after dinner, so it's, it's a little bit messed up. Um, I only had one beer to drink, but I somehow managed to mess this up. So this is an experiment in vivo where we gave animals testosterone. Uh, this is the LINCAP model. And one thing to point out here that affects also the clinical development of this is even though these cells are, these tumors are much, much smaller, if you look at the PSA level of these cells and the PSA level of these cells, it's almost fourfold increase even though these cells are fourfold smaller. So it makes using PSA as a marker in the clinic a little bit complicated when you give testosterone because it stimulates production. We also see quite a bit of increased death here. So this is more, I think, than just growth inhibition and in, in sort of stabilization of the tumor. We do see actually induction of, of, of apoptosis. But mechanistically, another thing we think may happen, and this would require a whole other talk to explain this, but testosterone, in addition to, Andrew, in addition to being a, a transcription factor, we think is also involved in, in, in replication. So androgen receptor binds to origins of replication. It has to be degraded as these cells go through cycle to allow the cells to re, uh, reboot and start the next cycle. And if that doesn't happen correctly, when the cell tries to go through cycle, it will die. So experimentally, one way we showed this is if you look at mitotic figures in a prostate tumor, you can see this is the normal cells that are brown here. That's androgen receptor in the nucleus. But when you look at mitotic figures, there's no androgen receptor. They're not brown. They're, they're blue. This is the dappy part. Um, if you look at cells being treated with testosterone, now all the mitotic figures have androgen receptor where they shouldn't have it. So we think that there's a dysregulation of the, of the cell cycle uh, by giving this high dose. We're somehow stabilizing AR. It's not getting degraded correctly as the cell goes through cycle. There's too much AR, and we've stabilized it by giving a high dose of androgen. So that's the first two spots on my list. This is the rest of the list of mechanisms. So I'm sort of keeping a list every time I read a paper of other things that androgen does. So it can certainly affect oncogene expression, tumor suppressor expression. It induces reactive oxygen species. It seems to suppress neuroendocrine transdifferentiation. 
And I'm going to show you some data later where we think it might even activate innate immunity when we, we use these, uh, this agent. So our hypothesis here was maybe we could give men with castrate-resistant disease kind of a high level of testosterone to achieve these effects. And then we thought if we cycled it between high and low, they wouldn't be able to adaptively regulate the AR. We sort of confused them. Um, and in those cells that were able to adapt and downregulate AR, they potentially could be resensitized to low androgen again, to low, to low therapies. So we came up with the term bipolar androgen therapy, which not everybody likes, but that's, that's what we chose. Um, I will tell you, bipolar androgen therapy has got me invited to a lot of psychiatric conferences because <laughs> I think people think I work on bipolar disease. Um, and we've shortened that to BAT. And we've had fun with BAT and Batman and different versions of BAT. I have a little Batman statue now in my office. So what we're doing basically is taking testosterone cypionate, which is FDA-approved, kind of old-school, generic testosterone. In, I think it's in sesame seed oil. And we chose that because it's the one way we can get a kind of a super physiologic level versus the gels that people use, because those, only, those are designed to give you just euganadal levels. We inject this. We get a very high peak level. We're probably getting to two or 3,000 nanograms per deciliter. An average normal level for most of you in the room who are young is probably five, 600. Those of you who are old is two, 300. Um, the guys we treat in the clinic are zero because they're castrate. And we were trying to go very high and very low over the uh, treatment cycle. And our idea is if the cells have very high AR levels, they're going to be vulnerable when the testosterone is high. And when they have, if they have very low levels, they should be vulnerable when we drop it back down. So it's a way to kind of shock the cells like I talked about before. Now, this isn't a new concept. Again, I, I mentioned Dr. Huggins has thought of everything. So he already had thought of this idea long ago. And this is a picture of him accepting the Nobel Prize <clears throat> in the 1960s for androgen deprivation. And in his speech, the last paragraph describes this two ways to affect hormonal uh, cancers. Deprive them of the hormones, which we spent 70 years doing, or actually giving them too much. And he called that hormone interference. Now, bizarrely, he was a urologist, and he went on to, to demonstrate this principle in patients with breast cancer. And I, I guess it was a different time. Their different department chairs didn't seem to mind, but that, that's what he did most of his latter career. And he worked on leukemia and, and steroids in a, in a weird way. But, but again, he had sort of already described this phenomenon. So this was our first study. And this was uh, funded by um, a foundation called the One in Six Foundation, which was a foundation started by a patient of mine who gave us uh, a little bit of money, very little bit of money, um, to do a clinical study. And we had this evidence about DNA repair uh, as one of the potential mechanisms. So our first study was testosterone and etoposide, which would block DNA repair in combination. And we, we decided to give them in three weeks of therapy, three cycles of therapy and evaluate, look at the PSA level. And those men who were declining, we'd continue. And those going up, we'd stop. Um, we decided that if they were... Um, progressing on three cycles. Sorry, this thing keeps beeping on me. We would just, if they were responding after three cycles, we'd stop the etoposide and continue the testosterone. Um, and uh, we weren't expecting much to happen, but we saw patients like this, where we would start the treatment, they'd initially have a spike in their PSA, and there was sort of a ratcheting effect. But we had a good number of men have pretty significant drops in their PSA level. And correspondingly, pretty significant regression of their tumors. Um, this patient, for example, stayed on the treatment for 18 cycles. And then when we stopped, he even responded more when we went back to kind of a castrate level. So kind of feeding into this whole hypothesis that we have. Not everybody responded. Some guys didn't maybe responded for a short term, but we, were quite in, we weren't really expecting to see actual PSA response um, in this study. So overall, eight of the men had some decline. 30% had, we use this 50% decline in prostate cancer as our bar for success. Uh, four guys actually stayed on for longer than a year. One guy stayed on for three years. Um, we had a 50% response rate based on the uh, uh, CAT scans. 
And then interestingly, all the patients who got put on some additional therapy after testosterone responded. So we had a 100% response. And some of them even responded to drugs that they were failing at the beginning. So some of the men on bicalutamide, we put them back on bicalutamide, and they responded again. So it was very interesting. And this is just the range of some of the PSA response we saw in the patients and uh, some of the uh, radiologic response. So we tried to make as much hay out of that as possible and started writing grants. Um, and in my career, this is probably the only time I'll ever get two grants for the same thing. Uh, slightly different, but the same thing. So this is an R01 that we received, uh, funded. And the idea of this grant, this uh, trial, we were gonna take men progressing on either abiraterone or enzalutamide, give them testosterone for as long as they responded, and then re-challenge them with the same drug they had been failing. So the abiraterone patients got abiraterone and the enzalutamide, the correspondingly, got enzalutamide. Patients could have had both, and we, we basically put them on the arm that they got last. So some guys had enzalutamide, then abiraterone, vice versa. Um, we, we came up with this uh, acronym, resensitizing with superphysiologic testosterone to overcome resistance, and we call this the RESTORE study. Uh, we treated uh, 30 guys or tried to get 30 guys on each arm. Recently, we opened up a third arm where the men are just newly castrate resistant who've never seen these drugs because we wanted to see if we shifted this earlier, would we get a different response? I'm not going to show you any data because we're still doing that, that part. So our endpoint was 50% decrease, uh, response to retreatment, and we had a lot of different safety and quality of life things built into this metabolic parameters. I'll, I'll show you a little bit of that uh, today. Uh, we're still kind of analyzing those kind of parameters. So they had to be continued on androgen deprivation because we wanted to clamp their endogenous testosterone production so we could control it. They had a progression. We really didn't want men with any worrisome lesions, so anybody with look, looking like something could compress their spinal cord, worried about urinary tract problems, um, we, we eliminated. And then we learned along the way that men who have any pain due to prostate cancer, we had a few guys slip through our nets thinking that they had just had arthritis. We found that if they had pain from prostate cancer and when they get testosterone, the pain gets dramatically worse very quickly. They'll go home from the clinic and call us up eight hours later in excruciating pain, sometimes requiring narcotics, sometimes even requiring admission to the hospital. And that pain usually lasts about a week. And then in those few patients, it actually gets better, which, which is an intriguing thing for us as well. So you're not meant to read this, but the key here is just to say that um, the groups were pretty balanced. Uh, these were men whose PSA was relatively uh, elevated, 20 to 30. And then we had some men that were, were quite elevated. Um, a lot of the men had a mixed disease, um, but half of them had only disease in the bone. Um, on the study. This is our waterfall plot of PSA response, sort of very complicated color scheme here. The bottom line is about, um, if we look at the whole group, um, about 25% uh, of men responded by PSA. There didn't seem to be a big difference if you got two drugs before the testosterone or one drug. There did seem to be uh, a higher response in men who got testosterone after enzalutamide than in men who got testosterone after abiraterone. So if you look here in this table, the group who got it after enzalutamide had a 30% response, after abiraterone only an 18% response. And there really was no difference if they got two drugs, one drug um, in this story. And then just coning down on the guys who got enzalutamide, because I, I have more analysis of that data, we had about a, six of 14 of the patients had a uh, disease we could actually measure. So about 40% of them had an objective response, which is pretty good. The median progression-free survival was about nine months. And we wrote this paper that if you want to read more about this, is in the Lancet Oncology uh, this year, um, which just looks at the enzalutamide cohort. We're still analyzing the abiraterone group. Overall, this was pretty safe, remarkably. So probably the biggest complaint men have is kind of a non, not always, we don't think it's cancer related, but kind of an achiness that they get in their muscles and, and bones. There's an increase in hemoglobin. Um, most men have some sexual effects, so breast tenderness or 
gynecomastia, which is breast enlargement. Hot flashes were seen. Um, some men, even though we tried to make them feel better, um, had fatigue. Um, interestingly, all of these, we, we don't have a good adverse event for feeling better. It's only feeling, wor- all of the things we talk about are feeling worse. So there's not like a scale for the other way. Because I guess we never really see anybody feeling better on any treatments we get. So I don't have a good quantification of feeling better. Uh, but a lot of men felt better and felt more energy. And the guys who still had sexual function could restore their sexual function. And they were extremely happy about that. We, we really tweaked the libido in these men. So some of these men were in their 80s, and it was quite interesting to watch an 85-year-old man get the libido of an 18-year-old man. Um, so that's, I don't know if that's a side effect, but they had that. Um, we didn't, the, the, AE, the, the, the more severe things we saw, we didn't see any trend emerge. We saw some isolated things, whether that was related to the, the testosterone or the fact that we were treating 70 and 80-year-old men in many cases. Uh, we had one guy have a heart attack, one PE, one person have some worsening urinary tract obstruction, some other things. Um, we're looking at that now in, in the larger studies to see if there's any theme here. And this is the quality of life thing we did. We did a bunch of these surveys. And this is not really my expertise, but we, we kind of saw things moving in the direction we hoped. So these surveys, these arrows are meant to show. So these are the guys, who, this is after getting a couple months of testosterone. And this is after going back on enzalutamide. You can see that in each case, the testosterone, uh, we never re- achieve statistical significance because uh, of the small numbers, but things tend to move in a, in a better direction. The only thing that hit significance for us was erectile function, uh, which markedly improved in the guys who got testosterone. Um, I've subsequently now put, we, we meant to do this as two separate groups and not combine the data. So at the end of the day, the trial was positive. We hit our endpoint in both groups for PSA response, but there wasn't enough power to see some, to, to statistically confirm these, these results. So we've been looking at combining them, and at least in the quality of life realm, because they all got testosterone. And we do see some statistical significant improvement when we do that in fatigue and in uh, this pain index compared to um, baseline. So we're going to do more of that and have a more thorough story, hopefully, in the next few months. And then we also saw some extreme responder guys, which, because um, th- it's going to lead me to other stories, I'll just tell you. I, I-, I hate to show just anecdotes, I- but we had a few guys that are- were interesting that we learned from. So this is an example of one of our extreme responders. You can see his story. He was on an old antiandrogen lilulamide. He was on an adrenal poison ketoconazole at two different doses. He then got, once enzalutamide came out, enzalutamide at a reduced dose because he had severe fatigue. And he did have a response to enzalutamide that lasted for um, maybe six months. And then he started to progress. And this is when we started him on testosterone. And he subsequently uh, had uh, basically a complete response. So his PSA went to zero. And his, all of his disease disappeared for, t- for two years. And then I went to a meeting and kind of casually mentioned he might have been cured. And the next month, he progressed. So that was a, I jinxed him a little bit. But he's now four years and his PSA is about here. Um, so we had a meeting one day and said, if we could just figure out what the hell is going on with this guy, maybe we go on to something. So the first thing we looked at was, does he have any DNA repair problems? And to our great surprise, he had inactivating mutations in both BRCA2 and ATM, both of them important DNA repair uh, proteins. And I told you before the story about how we could, we're seeing these double-stranded breaks and whether those two things are related, I don't know. But we started looking at this now. So this is an early look at some of the folks on the trial. We're going to try to do this with more patients. But you kind of see that these are guys who either have homologous repair defects, mutations, or we're seeing a, T, a P53 signal also. And those are the guys that seem to respond We have more patients here now, but the people that don't have that do not have this dramatic PSA response. Only the the patients who, not all of them, but but the patients who have DNA repair seem to be the ones who have the the big response. And then we also have looked at this uh, androceptor variant. So this is a variant that I mentioned at the beginning. 
So normally the, the full length androgen receptor has a ligand binding part, a DNA binding part, and an end terminal domain that's kind of where all the co-activators bind um, to, to regulate the gene. Some prostate cancer cells make a splice variant at the RNA level where they splice out the ligand binding domain. So they only have DNA binding and this end terminal domain. And this truncated protein remains transcriptionally active despite the li without the ligand, but probably not as good, but it certainly is still uh, uh, active. And so a lot of work by our group and others demonstrated that if you have tumors that start expressing this, you don't respond here, nobody out of 12 and nobody out of six, nobody responds to second-line hormone therapy. Bigger studies showed that maybe a few people respond, but for the most part, it, it indicates no response. And it also indicates bad cancer. So this was just a look at these guys. You can see the hazard ratio here is 16, which is pretty unbelievable. Um, if you have the V7, this variant, your survival is very short. These cancers don't even behave like prostate cancer, in my opinion. They're almost like leukemia. Um, and so this is a bad marker. So we looked at, in our, in our study here, what, what did this do, testosterone? So we knew from cell lines that if you take, uh, this is a cell line that makes the, these variants, the ARV7, when you give androgen, very quickly it turns off the variant. Um, by 48 hours, you don't see any. So in our study, we had, we've looked at 52 samples. We've had 28 guys. The, this test requires you to have circulating tumor cells. So 14 were negative. 28 were positive, and they, hadn't, they didn't have the variant. We had 10 guys with the variant. So all the guys who are negative stay negative after th testosterone. Nine of 10 became negative who had the variant, so they all looked like this. And then two of those had a, had a response, and five of them had some response. And then unfortunately, as soon as we put them back on whatever drug they were on, all of them went back to um, V7 um, positive. So just like the cell line. This happens very fast. This is two-day exposure to androgen, and then we stop and put them back on enzalutamide, and this is at five days. And if anything, you can see they're making more of the variant um, than when they started. So this looked good to us. We're not sure what to make of this yet in terms of ideas about therapy, uh, but unfortunately, this was not a permanent uh, effect. And then the last part of this is, did we actually restore sensitivity to hormone therapy? Um, and so this is what we saw in the guys who got enzalutamide and then got enzalutamide again. So 70% of them had a PSA response um, post-enzalutamide, -enzo uh, 20% post-abiraterone. Unfortunately, that response duration was short, uh, about four to six months in these patients. But it was intriguing that we could sort of reboot the tumor a little bit um, and get a longer response from the drug. So the other grant that I was able to get a little bit later, which is why probably the reason I'm here, because this was a large trial. This was funded by the Department of Defense, a grant called a Transformative Impact Grant, which they have occasionally. Um, we call this the Transformer Trial to pay homage to the grant. And this is probably the most complicated acronym I'll ever make, but Transformer actually means something. I can never remember what it means, but, but that's what we called it. Um, and it allowed us to kind of keep with the superhero theme. So the Transformer trial looks like this. This, because of the PSA problem, because testosterone stimulates PSA, we decided to use progression. Um, so this is a randomized trial. Half of the men get randomized to enzalutamide, and half of the men get randomized to androgen. And it's probably the only trial where men get a drug and the exact opposite of the drug in a randomized fashion. Um, we basically designed this to detect a 50% improvement in clinical or radiographic progression-free survival. Uh, 194 patients, one-to-one -one randomization. The men were allowed to cross over at progression to the opposite arm. And then we did this at 17 sites in the U.S. We completed enrollment in January and I learned two days ago that we hit the number of events we need to actually start analyzing the data. So hopefully in the next few months we'll actually have some results. Uh, I've been mostly a laboratory person, so clinical trials are very frustrating because it takes a long time to get all the data. It's not like doing mice where you do treat them, three weeks later, results. 
Um, so we're excited to see what happens. Um, these are the sites. You guys were one of the sites, and you, I really appreciate you participating in this weird thing that at first no one thought we could do, so just because it's weird. Um, but these are the sites around the U.S. that added tri uh, patients, and this is the DOD folks that helped us. I don't have any data to show yet from this. Um, maybe if I were to come back in a month, I'd have data. But, but uh, we're excited to see how this works, and I, at least to think at the end of the day, we, we feel like we tested the concept uh, in a rigorous way. So a couple points to take home. Looks like we can get safely this drug, testosterone, to asymptomatic men. We definitely see responses. We definitely see some resensitization. And clearly there's some men who really have a big improvement in quality of life. But there's many questions we have to answer. We talked about some of those today with the folks that I met. How do we move this forward? First of all, from a standpoint of funding, because there's no drug company here. What are the biomarkers? What's the right dose? Should we give this? Is the shocking thing we're doing the right way? Should we give it continuously? What can we combine with it? So just a couple quick pieces of data at the end here. This double strand thing is kind of interesting to us because in addition to causing these breaks, sometimes they don't get fixed right and you get new antigens. So this experiment shows that you can produce this tempers to erg rearrangement by giving testosterone. And then recently in the lab, we, we saw this very strange thing. We were intrigued by the fact that when you give testosterone, men get worse pain very rapidly, which suggested some kind of inflammatory response. So what we've been seeing is when we give testosterone to cells that are responsive, one, they start spitting DNA into the cytosol, and they kind of go through nucleophagy where this DNA is within phagosomes, which are marked here by this LC3 stain. They also are the DNA that's been broken, marked by this gamma H2X. And that seems to induce an immune response. So here we show sting getting activated, which is the inducer of interferon genes. And this slide shows you that a lot of those interferon genes get turned on in cells that are sensitive, but in the orange, cells that aren't sensitive don't really turn it on much. And one of those genes we looked at was CXCL10, which is a chemoattractant cytokine. You can see in this cell line, we get a 1,600-fold induction with testosterone. And if you look at these cells in vivo, these are, this is a xenograph that we're staining for CXCL10. So there's a huge upregulation. One of the things CXCL10 does is it acts as an NK cell attractant and a T cell attractant. So in nude mice, we don't have T cells very much, but we have a lot of NK cells. You can see when we give T to these xenografts, this is the control, we get a huge, this is state for CD57, we get a huge infiltration of NK cells after the testosterone. So it's very intriguing to us what that all means. We've also seen two guys, I'll show you quickly, who got a lot of testosterone, got some other treatments, and then ended up on a, a checkpoint inhibitor phase one trial. This guy was on a pembrolizumab trial. This guy was on nivolumab. And these guys, so far with prostate cancer responses to these checkpoint inhibitors has not been very good. These guys, these guys both had dramatic responses. This patient here is now two years on nivolumab with no disease. And we made the leap saying, well, the only thing they had in common was they both got testosterone. Maybe there's something to that. So we convinced Bristol Myers to pay for a trial, which is called the COMBAT trial, um, where the patients get a lead-in of a couple cycles of testosterone, and then they get combination with nivolumab. Um, the, the great thing for me about this trial is we're doing mandatory biopsies at the beginning and after testosterone. So we're, we're going to actually have some tissue to look at to see if some of these things are actually real. Uh, we opened this trial uh, a couple months ago, got a few patients on already, and so hopefully within a year or two we'll have some results. So I'm going to stop there. This is our team at Hopkins um, creating this team to do a large, what was a randomized phase two, uh, was pretty incredible. Um, we were pretty much a drug company, um, and uh, it, it was really a, a great learning experience for me. These are the folks that helped fund us, uh, NIH, DOD. I mentioned the One in Six Foundation, and Bruce Hunsiger was the patient of mine who really got this all started. So really, I always present this in his memory as a sort of a little acorn that has now grown into at least maybe an oak tree. Who knows? Um, so I'll be happy to take questions, and thanks for your attention.
Sam, thanks so much. And maybe before we do any questions, we're just going to make two, uh, just a brief presentation. So first of all, um, we visited a little bit about the res uh, respective histories for institutions. So here's a book on the history of the School of Medicine here in Colorado. Oh, we awesome. spent a little time in Building 500, now called the Fitzsimmons Building, and so you're going to have that. And then here's a, uh, a plaque to commemorate your visit, oh, wow. uh, which is great. We're Thank also going to have a plaque we'll keep here to commemorate your visit and the series as it moves awesome. forward. So thanks so much. Thank you very much. That's yeah. very lovely. All right. <laughs> Any questions? Do we have time for questions? We do, yeah. Actually, Kevin, time. Sort of. You want to be the question? Sure, Scott. Yeah. No, excuse me. Uh, you talk about the responses. Were there men who had an increase in, in the PSA slope, for instance, after the test office? This has been the, the fear, of course, for years is that you're going to make that worse. Yeah, so they, yeah, so they, um, obviously this is a tricky treatment because unlike most treatments where it either doesn't work at all or helps make, you know, regression, we always have the possibility to make it worse. So we, we're like paranoid about that, every patient. What we've seen is a group of patients, again, about 25% now that have this immediate decline in PSA. We have a second group of patients where um, the PSA tends to jump up after the first cycle to a level that sometimes scares a patient. And then it sort of kind of plateaus where it bounces around up and down a little bit. Some patients, even though in our trials that meets our progression endpoint, we've decided, well, they feel actually clinically a lot better and their scans look stable. So we give them the option, if they want, to keep going. So we've had a good number of those patients now where we followed them. And we've seen some people have sort of a stable disease story for quite a while, you know, two years or more. Um, so they're the confusing group to me. I'm not sure what's happening there. And then we have a third group where the disease kind of marches along kind of at a pace almost similar to the, how it was marching along before. So we're not getting a good signal that we're accelerating anything. But there is a group where we're not doing anything uh, you know, with them. So, But we, we're always cautious of, particularly the pain thing has been a cautionary tale where uh, we knew from historical kind of studies that this would cause worse pain. So we've tried to screen pretty well for that, um, and um, we've been pretty good. So the people that don't have pain, when we give them testosterone, they don't seem to get pain. It's almost like a threshold that we don't get above. But people with pain, if we give it to them, sometimes that pain is really bad. Professor Glaude, in the one front of those historical studies we did... Uh, Maggie will know Dick Santon is an andrologist, and Andrew is a fellow. Yes. We did a study like this in 1986, before we had these drugs and before we had PSA. And we saw the pain response within like hours. Yes. So our approach was to do rat studies. And it turned out with MRI, if you had a castrate rat, and then did MRIs of the prostate itself within. Within one hour, the prostate would swell with water based on the MRI. Interesting. So I think it's a very early vascular response that causes the increase in pain. And then maybe these inflammatory things happen. Yeah, because there is, you know, PSA does regulate VEGF. I'm not, I mean, androgen can regulate VEGF, you're right, and it, which VEGF is also a vascular permeability factor. So we hadn't really... We, I don't know how to look at that but we in the patients, but we I guess that's a possible... Because it does seem to be, it, it doesn't seem to be tumor growing in that short of a time. So it's something physiologic that's, like I said, it could be fluid that's swelling. Now, what's been intriguing is after we do it, you know, the patients come back, the pain gets better in about a week. And again, it's only been a handful. But they're like, well, I feel better now. Can we keep going? And when we give them a second dose, we don't see the same thing. Uh, it's almost like, I don't know what, what we've done, but, but so... We've, we've flirted with the idea of trying to do a study in men with pain, but we thought getting that through the IRB would probably be tricky. So, more questions? So, uh, Maggie, you want to go ahead? So, um, I'm men. Um, they warned me about you. <laughs> and so, you know, we know from the original studies done, even with high physiologic and pharmacologic PGL, they killed men. Yes, it'll be very interesting to see with this on-off pattern that you're doing, your DVT and, and 
Well, yeah. Yeah, so one of the side effects we see, we saw a lot was edema in the lower extremities. Um, and uh, we've tried, well, we've tried to screen folks for cardiovascular disease, but probably not in an aggressive way. Um, we, and we've had a sprinkling of, you know, we had a guy have an MI, we had a guy develop AFib. We've had maybe one or two folks along the way get DVT, or get, or get P, actually it's been PE, and it's only been like asymptomatic because we're screening them and we see it. Um, but it's complicated because they have prostate cancer, which itself is a risk for DPE, and it didn't seem to be like extraordinarily high. Amount. So we're kind of aware of those things and cautious, but um, we haven't seen a huge signal of that. Um, but we are treating old men, and it is, we've gotten more bold. You know, the original group were like very cautious, and they're like, well, it looks like you could do that one. And, you know, now it's pretty much all comers unless they have symptomatic disease. I have one or two more questions. These guys over here are jumping around. James, too. we'll go to Jennifer after that. The group question. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we thought about, well, part of it is who pays for all those things, but we thought about lots of ways. I mean, could we give it more as like a square wave where you give daily testosterone, get the level up, and then you stop it and the level just drops? There's ways to do that, although the gels that are available, it, it's hard to get the level really high with the gels unless the guy does like five doses, and they're, they're expensive, and so, if, if you, you know. Um, the biomarker, we, we also thought about, well, what about just keeping it steady until the PSA changes and then drop? So, yeah, that, that, that would be sort of future things we'd like to do. Or we talked today, we, we thought about it, and you guys thought about it, is could you do, like, testosterone for a while and then an anti-androgen for a while and then testosterone? So, again, ideas that we're thinking about. Um, we're going to run into trouble, though, because we've been using grants to fund this. And as you know, now that we've done it, we're going to apply for grants and hear, well, this is not innovative anymore and blah, blah, blah. So, so we're worried that we've, we, we had our moment. It was fast. So we've got to come with something different. One more question over here. Jennifer? So do you guys, do you guys have biopsies written into the grants? Because I'm wondering, the major amounts seem to make a lot of, or in the payment sample, did they change enough to make it more Right, so, I mean, prostate cancer is kind of a cold tumor in terms of the immune system. So everybody's thinking about ways to make it a hot tumor and, you know, potentially allow immune checkpoint therapies to work better. Um, the study I just mentioned at the end is the first one we're going to actually have biopsies. So we're going to have a baseline biopsy and a three-month biopsy. So we have all kinds of questions that, you know, we want to answer that related to the immune infiltration, DNA breaks, et cetera. So we're probably going to be able to section the entire thing and do all the questions. So, yeah, we don't know the answer. We, 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 we're, we, we, we're not sure that it's a good thing or a bad thing. This is kind of recent stuff we just we kind of fell into in a random kind of walking kind of way. Um, Well, we're gonna we've we've got it set up that we're also gonna look for blood levels of CXCL10, which we just did a chemokine assay across the cell lines. We looked at about 20 different chemokine interferon regulated things, and the ones that pop were the CXCL10. So we kind of discovered what we thought maybe we already knew. We spent a lot of money to learn something we knew already, and CCL2 also went up, um, and it was seemed like it was androgen regulated. So. It, there, and, I, and I think we had a guy tell us there might be an ARE in CXCL10. Um, so those things are uh, um, under, and we were excited because the first guy on this combat trial 
had like an 80% drop in his PSA after the first dose of testosterone. So he may also be a responder. We'll get our first biopsy. Um, our temptation will be to write like a big case report right away because, and then it'll never happen again. That's the usual thing that happens to us. Well, maybe in the, in the interest of time, then I'd just like to once again thank Dr. Denmead for coming today. We were delighted to have you. If there's some residual questions, I'm sure we can stay a little time down here. So thank you again for being here. Well, thank you all for your attention.